Welcome to the panel on the role of finance in addressing global challenges. Um, let me begin by thanking the United Nations and the World Academy of Art and Science for convening this platform. And in particular, I'd like to thank Gary Jacobs for his inspiring leadership of this effort. And thanks to the many that have worked so hard at the World Academy and the UN to make this happen. And thank you to the audience for, for attending this. And I know we're in many different time zones today. Um, this will be an exciting panel and I'm delighted to be your host. We will provide lessons from diverse perspectives and experiences of practitioners addressing current challenges um, and grandly looking far out if we can into the future at how finance can make a difference and the financial services industry can make a difference to, to the world. We have a very talented and highly experienced panel for you of diverse practitioners. Uh, there have been a few sessions on finance and its impact in the world and the financial system during this four-day period. Um, this panel is, is somewhat different because we've tried to fill the panel with people who are uh, practitioners themselves and from all over the world. So we have practitioners from the US, from the EU, Japan, Singapore, China, India, encompassing sovereign wealth funds, uh, a macro fund, private equity, development finance, housing finance, and real estate. They lead groups and institutions in delivering to their mandates, which include, of course, making money, but also, of course, making an impact. Uh, some have a very short-term horizon and some have a very long-term horizon. So we'll get those quite varied experiences too. But I'd be remiss if I didn't comment that actually they have much wider experience than what they do today. So this group has experience in investing, in banking, in trading, in development finance, in private wealth management, asset management, financial inclusion, economics, and quite a few things more. Um, unless they say otherwise during the response to some of the questions we're, we're going to address, the views they express are their own rather than their organizations, of course. Um, a brief introduction, I'm Katan Patel. I head the investment firm Greater Pacific Capital um, our investment fund, the latest one, is investing in India and the development and growth of India to become a global player. I'm the moderator for the session that begins, and Christian Hansmeier is my co-moderator. Chris, would you make a brief introduction, please, too? Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Christian Hansmeier. I am an investment manager at Greater Pacific Capital, where I head the firm's risk and research activities. Chris will uh, take questions, too. Uh, you'll find as, uh, as part of the audience and as an observer that there is a Q&A function. Please, please feel free to add your questions there and Chris will monitor them and pick them up at the back end and we will put them to, um, to the group. Um, there is a chat also to share your thoughts with us and with each other, of course. Um, so first, let me ask each of the panelists to make a brief introduction of themselves, please. Uh, we begin with Neha. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Neha Grover. I'm, uh, I lead the South Asia practice for private equity funds for IFC. IFC is one of the largest development financial institutions in the world and we focus on investing in the private markets across emerging uh, markets. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. Um, Prakash. Thanks, Ketan, and uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Prakash Kanan, and I'm a uh, Managing Director and uh, Chief Economist at GIC, which is one of uh, Singapore's sovereign wealth funds. Uh, I had uh, previous stints with the International Monetary Fund, uh, as well as the uh, Central Bank of Malaysia. Um, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today, and I look forward to a good discussion. Thank you, Prakash. Adam? Good morning, everyone. Thanks. Katan for the uh, invite. I'm Adam Levinson. I'm the uh, founder and chief investment officer of Radicule uh, Asset Management Asia, which is a Singapore-based uh, macro fund uh, focused on Asia, but investing globally uh, in liquid markets. Prior to that, I was a principal at uh, Fortress uh, for really since uh, inception and, and, and then uh, relocated to Asia 10 years ago. Thank you, Adam. Norman. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Kitan. My name is Norman Rush. I live in Frankfurt. 
uh, I spent most of my um, my um, life in uh, in banking. I looked after German institutions. I sold um, equities to German investors uh, for Goldman Sachs. I headed this business in Europe. Um, and currently I am in real estate and looking after family office predominantly uh, and help them to invest in Europe, um, in European um, real estate. Thank you, Norman. Anjali. Good morning, my name is Anjali Tarapur. I work for HDFC in India. HDFC is the pioneer of mortgage finance in India. And today HDFC is a financial conglomerate with interests across banking, asset management, insurance. I have a keen interest in macroeconomics, housing finance, uh, financial inclusion, and emerging markets. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Ding Wen? Thank you, Katan. Uh, I'm calling from Shanghai. Uh, uh, my name is Ding Wei, and uh, I'm CRCC Capital's chairman. CRCC uh, uh, Capital is the investment arm, equity investment arm of the invest, uh, investment bank CRCC. Uh, I, in my previous capacity, I worked at World Bank and RMF, also at the Tomasek, also Deutsche Bank, and uh, I have two terms at CRCC. First, as the head of investment banking, now I'm running the equity investment arm of CRCC. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dingwei. Osamu. Yes, Ketan, thank you. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here today. Uh, my name is Osamu Yamamoto. I'm a partner at Unison Capital, which is a uh, sustainability-focused private equity firm based in Tokyo, uh, Seoul, and in Singapore. I'm based in Singapore in charge of business developments in ASEAN and in India. I look forward to uh, exchange uh, views with my co-panelists and uh, with the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me make a brief presentation to set the context of, of the discussion, and then we'll, we'll dig into three big questions in particular. So firstly, finance. Um, what do we mean by that in this context? So we see finance in its context as a fundamental tool that underpinned and helped the world build civilizations. Um, we'll distinguish it from money, money of course, and finance as more of the financial system have been two underpinning agents of course of civilizations, but they've also been sometimes the reason, the arbiter and the mainstay of war and peace. Um, finance of course is something that, the, that turns into a system when there is a civilization and of course, if finance is not properly spread and distributed across the civilization, there's a transition of systems. And that transition in history has often not been very pleasant and sometimes has, of course, caused enormous conflict. We find ourselves at the interject intersection of a change potentially of civilizations, certainly of the world order. And the big question we wish to consider in the second and third part of this discussion is whether finance is ready and able to adapt to transform itself and to help address the issues of today and to help build the civilization that will come. The 20th century, of course, was key in setting industrial finance up. Um, and the model we have today, of course, is the industrial finance model. That model is not, of course, the financial model that we'll see in the future. So the question of whether an industrial-based model that was designed to finance initially um, efforts to expand territories across the world. And then post the Second World War and the collapse of colonialism, it was of course financing trade and globalization. Um, can that adapt to a much more digital, distributed, democratized world where finance is transacted every day by everybody uh, using their computers and with each other? And this is a, such a big shift. Is our structure of finance and the type of participants able to cope, and we'll consider that very carefully. Now, there is a lot, of course, uh, said about how finance is not coping. Um, I would guess, though, that if you looked at 1945 and you said, what, what was the financial system designed to do? At that point in time, it was a very different financial system that they thought they were building. And through adaptation and evolution, of course, we have something much more robust. But looking back, we could not have predicted that we'd have five times the GDP per capita, and three times the population. So we had 
2.4 billion people in 1945, and today we have 7.8 billion. So this is a huge challenge, and the system has somehow still managed to deliver an increase in prosperity, still support peace and freedoms, um, and survive many of the changes of this 5x in GDP and tripling of the population. Now, what has happened as a result, though, is the real challenge that finance has to be part of in terms of part of solving. Um, capitalism itself, as we would all recognize it, um, is under strain, of course, because the side effects of capitalism have resulted in some devastation now of the environment, of communities, and massive inequities. Consumerism itself probably is one of the key drivers of that. Without making a normative judgment whether it's good or bad, consumerism, as it became mass consumerism, is the thing that would have driven the GDP. And finance's role would have been to finance the demand and finance the supply. And as we stripped more and more of the planet to allow us to keep consuming and adding more and more people and increasing the GDP, the side effects, of course, have been enormous. And people empowered by the internet and social media and the awareness, really, and consciousness have started to protest in large numbers. We saw that in the Arab Spring and thought it was a phenomenon, potentially, that was related to the Middle East. But we saw it spread to, to the UK in wishing to leave the EU. We saw it spread to the US in the 2016 election that was considered to be quite an upset. We've seen it come back to Hong Kong. And there have been 10 or 15 others of this type across the world of major protests. And today, today too, uh, during the COVID period, of course, we see Black Lives Matter as a massive movement. So there is an empowerment of people to protest. And if the financial service system cannot cope with that and cannot adapt to serve the people, we'd expect it to have a shock too. So part of what we will consider is, is how will it adapt? Um, and that uh, adaptation is quite an important thing for this group to discuss with us. I will um, step back and just wrapping up, give a few important points of statistics for us to focus on some of the key numbers. So the financial wealth uh, of the world is estimated last year to be approximately 350 trillion US dollars. 70% of that um, is held by households and 30% of that is held by governments. So the householder, the individual is a very powerful component in the financial system, often neglected, but a very powerful component. The choices they make will determine what the financial system in the end has to do. And that empowerment awareness is growing very rapidly in the world. So where are the assets? From the individuals and often from governments, the assets are ending up in banks at the first point of call. So 60% of the assets are in large financial institutions, the very large banks all over the world. Um, this is often referred to as big finance, of course, and we'll talk about that too. 30% end up in the hands of asset managers, um, funds of various types, particularly pension funds, uh, and insurance. And there's a small amount in the rest. If we then look at um, two more statistics, one is on interest rates. Interest rates vary for the developed world between minus 0 0.1 and plus 0 0.3 amongst the largest nations in the developed world. Um, the, and then the second statistic I'd like to put out is that we have reserves, which um, for the US are about $128 billion of reserves held by the US government. This was uh, for 2019. But if you contrast that, um, China has $3.1 trillion of reserves. Um, the EU has $1.5 trillion of reserves. Um, and Japan has $1.4 trillion of reserves, all of 2019. Clearly with low interest rates, we can print money. $15 trillion have been printed of potential stimulus that is going to be injected into the economies or has already been injected uh, during this pandemic. But no matter how much we can print, you can't close the gap between the US reserves and how much China and other parts of the world have today. So the dynamism of the US economy doesn't rest on its reserves. It rests on how capitalism and finance actually works because it is still, of course, the largest economy and the driver of the global economy, although that is rebalancing and changing. 
So with that, I'm, I'm going to focus on three important questions um, for the panel to focus on with us. The first is about the world and the role of finance in the world. The second um, will focus on the solutions. So we don't want to spend too much time just analyzing the problem. We'll focus on what are the big ideas and solutions that this panel and this group feel can be introduced into the world to make such a difference. And the third is execution. Can we really make change happen? Will it happen anyway? How do we adapt to that change and what will it look like? So those are the three parts. Um, let me begin um, with the first part of this and it's a focus on the world, its challenges and the role of finance in addressing those challenges. Um, I'll start with Adam. Adam, um, is finance in the financial services industry a positive force in addressing the world's challenges or not? And as a supplementary question, what are the challenges of big finance, big banks, and their relevance to the world? That's a very big question. Um, thanks, I'll take my- I'll, And you can handle that, I'm sorry. I'll take my shot at the time. I think the, that um, big finance, the, the, there is a, there's a very important role in finance in shaping the future. The, the, the problem is that the system as it exists today uh, is, is really part of what I'll, what I'll refer to as the legacy or the soon to be legacy financial system or financial infrastructure. It's, it's required and serves um, a, a, a number of, of useful purposes, but I, but I think it's sort of past the point of where, where we can sort of answer unequivocally that it's a, it's a force for good. It's sort of a necessary uh, utility today. Um, and in many ways, uh, I think it in, in rather shortly will evolve uh, in, into a, a formal utility. That ultimately is a question for policymakers. Uh, but the, the utility function of, of, the, of, of the large um, incumbent banks, particularly in the developed world, is rather clear. Uh, but their mission uh, has, has narrowed dramatically. And so they really now act as, um, act to service two different, two distinct groups in, in, in my opinion. At the low end or the mass market, uh, their purpose for, for around finance is the extension of credit via mortgages, credit cards, and largely acting as a ledger of accounts as deposit taking institutions. Um, and then at the high end of the market, uh, I think that they've become agents for largely for other financial actors, other financial intermediaries. In, in, in fact, I, I actually posit that in many ways, the, the large banks uh, of the developed world really now have been co-opted by private equity and they're, they're effect effectively distribution agents of private equity vehicles. And that may be, that may be uh, a, a force of good in some instances, but as I said, it, it's, it's not clear that uh, that's really part of their mission anymore. It's much more acting as agents. And, and of course, as we've finally moved into the world of mass fiscal expansion, they're acting as the infrastructure uh, agents for governments and, and, and the dispersal of these transfers. Wow. Thank you, Adam. That, that's, a, that's a powerful beginning. Legacy, uh, utilities and agents of others um, somehow losing their mandate or mission. But those, are, those are very big statements. Let me come to Norman. Norman, um, a, a, a broad question first and a specific one too, uh, to follow. H how do you see this from a European perspective, given Europe has this much more industrial finance model where they, they, they believe they finance real assets and real things, um, and, and that may absolutely be true. And also, if you wouldn't mind Norman reflecting on the EU itself as this great peace project, 
So how would you see the perspective from Europe? Um, I think Europe is, as you, as you mentioned, um, a success story. If you look at it from the peace and, um, and the holding togetherness in, in, over the last cent uh, couple of, of uh, years or few years. Um, but it's also under tremendous stress. And there are a number of big challenges that we are facing, uh, despite all the success that, um, that uh, we had. Um, first of all, Brexit is definitely one big challenge. And uh, that's going to change the land landscape uh, over the years to come. And also there are, um, in the, be between the uh, various parts of Europe, there are inequalities. So you have the south and the north, the poor part of, um, of Europe and, um, and the wealthier part of Europe. And, um, and Germany is definitely the driving force behind all European or most of European efforts. Um, but the banking system, interestingly enough, is, is very weak and um, probably amongst the weakest in, in uh, Germany, uh, in Europe. And that has to do with the fact that um, the, the clientele is changing. Um, the old big industrial companies, they are looking for new models or they don't exist anymore. And, um, and also the traditional clients, um, the private clients, they are not the wealthier clients, Adam referred to. Um, they are not um, using the services of the banks anymore. They have created their own infrastructure, basically, and their own network alongside the banks, but most, in most cases, outside the banks. So they are looking for, the banks are looking for new business models, and they are struggling to find them. Interesting, one of the positive things in this, in this current crisis is that they went back to giving credit. They are now seen in Germany or they have taken the role as, a, um, as, as somebody who is, is providing good services to the uh, German industry and give credits and help um, for the solution, be part of the solution of the crisis rather than the cause of the crisis um, that they were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Interesting, Norman. So you see a retrenchment in some ways back to the basics of what banking should be in terms of giving, giving the loans that are required to allow people to survive this crisis. Yeah. And, and I think that is, and they're now making money out of that, which is a relatively new experience or has been forgotten over the last few years. Yeah. And, um, and I think that is, that is seen also in the society as something very positive. Interesting. Norman, a specific question. Um, of the household wealth of the world, and I, and I said it was 70% of the wealth um, uh, of nearly $350 trillion, a very large proportion of that is in the hands of private wealthy individuals. Um, yeah. How are they or their next generation, I, I guess, because that money was made you know, somewhere in the past, um, how do they see their role now in this changing world? Um, I, I spoke to some of the younger people uh, of my, my clients to prepare for this call. And what's interesting um, for me is that I grew up and I lived my entire life basically believing that democracy is strong and is, um, is re resistant and, and has a lot of benefits to it. Now, if you talk to these people, to younger people, they're really concerned about democracy and losing what they have. And um, that's a new experience, I think, that, that th this generation is now, they're looking after the environment. They're really long-term rather than short-term. Um, they are not as greedy or you know, as, as asset-oriented than um, they were in the past. And uh, they're more a sharing um, community and generation um, than the previous generations has been. Um, let, me, let me come back to that and switch to Prakash for the moment. Prakash, um, you're in Singapore. Singapore is the leading financial hub in Asia. It, it always, has a, always had a competitor in Hong Kong, but recent events have, have benefited Singapore in terms of the flow of capital. 
Um, how, how do you see this challenge for finance, global challenges, given that Singapore is actually a relatively small, very wealthy but small economy, very open economy too? What role does finance play in, in, in Singapore's story? And the wider story of Singapore in the world? Uh, no, thanks, Katab. Um, I, I think there's a uh, there's a difference between kind of the role of finance and then the role of financial institutions. Um, uh, and I think Adam spoke uh, uh, very well on, uh, on how financial institutions per se uh, have changed. Um, for me, I think, I think the challenge here is that, you know, finance uh, per se um, is not going to be uh, the, the solution for everything. Um, but I think it can facilitate uh, some solutions. And I think the way that uh, we can help it facilitate is really uh, taking what it does best uh, and then trying to limit uh, a lot of the things that it doesn't do so well. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we've, we've used it a lot in, in Singapore is really in, in trying to do that intergenerational transfer uh, of resources. Uh, and you know, this, this was all the time from, uh, uh, from Lee Kuan Yew uh, where he felt that, you know, as a small open economy, uh, there was a need uh, for us to be uh, self-reliant uh, to a certain extent. Um, and the ability to uh, not only build up savings, but also uh, maximize the return on it such that it eventually gets reinvested back into the community uh, uh, in the future. Um, and that's where I think a lot of the, um, uh, the role of GIC uh, has, has kind of played a big part, right? Because uh, as we've seen in the, in the past few months, um, you know, if you, you do have a rainy day fund uh, and there are times uh, in, in, a, in a country's lifetime where, where it does rain uh, and it does rain pretty heavily. Yes. Um, and that's where you, you see that kind of benefit of um, uh, kind of this intertemporal transfer of resources um, so having that ability to uh, to really make that long term decisions, uh, I think that's one of the areas where where finance really um, really plays a role, and and it's one where we've really uh, uh, maximised to some extent in, in Singapore. And would you comment a little bit on the the disruption that is happening in Hong Kong and how it might affect Singapore and affect the region? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's a very um, uh, uh, challenging question. I mean, in, in Singapore, obviously, we, we, we wish the best for, uh, for, for Hong Kong. Uh, you know, we, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, 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 close ties. Uh, and I think, you know, in general, um, if, if Hong Kong does well, actually Singapore uh, does well as well. Uh, you know, I don't think these two things are uh, necessarily uh, uh, mutually exclusive. A lot of close ties between uh, Hong Kong and, and China, and uh, you know, for a company that's really looking to uh, to do business with the hinterland in uh, in, in China, uh, Hong Kong is still is still the best place uh, to to set up shop. Um, Singapore, really, um, you know, we 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 are really thinking very much about uh, about the future, um, and uh, finance is one part of it, but. Um, you know, there's just a whole host of other, uh, other challenges, everything pertaining to deglobalization, um, uh, as well as uh, automation, what that means for, for our workforce, uh, and importantly, also climate change, right? I mean, you know, we are on average about 15 meters above sea level, uh, and so climate change is very much a, a big issue. So it's, it's one part of, uh, of many other uh, issues that we are, we're trying to deal with. Interesting. Um, that, that's a good point to bring you and Ding Wei. Ding Wei, um, you have such a wide experience in different types and different aspects of finance and different organizations. As, a, as one of the largest investors in China, uh, how do you see finance contributes in positive or negative ways to human and social developments in the past and looking ahead to? Loading way. Ding way. Do we have you? I'm, I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna come back to Ding Wei. I think um, 
Uh, we may need the Hello. Hi, hi, Ding Wei, do we have you back? Ding Wei, why don't I come back to you? Um, let, me, let me switch it to, um, to India, um, but also the, the big development challenge too. And I'm going to ask you, Anjali, to, to comment for me here. But if you look at the industrial finance model that we have today, um, we, we point to its successes sometimes, its failures, but one of the things sometimes we forget is that a third of the people in the world have a, a bank account um, and use that bank account. Two thirds either have a bank account which they don't use, they don't feel comfortable, they're not familiar with financial products, um, or don't have a platform, digital or otherwise, from which they are today accessing a financial product. So all the great successes of, you know, 5x in GDP uh, in the world, um, and that's such a singular, small, narrow measure, somehow amidst the story for us that two thirds of the world are not real participants. And oddly enough, that includes nearly 30% of Americans. Um, it includes, of course, a large number of, in, of, of Indians, nearly 70% nearly nearly of Indians. Um, but it, it isn't a phenomena only restricted to the developing world. Um, so Anjali, from the lens of a developing emerging market economy, um, how do you think of the current environment? What do you see as the challenges and the bright spots as, as far as the financial system is concerned. Right. Thank you, Kethan. And, you know, all our fellow panelists so far have really set the stage nicely. I'll just try and move a little more towards looking at the emerging markets right now. Now, one has to appreciate that a lot of the woes of the global financial system predate the COVID crisis. And some of these issues get amplified in the current environment. And never before has the world seen simultaneous demand and supply evaporate overnight. Now, the thing is, most countries today are facing a health, humanitarian, economic, and financial crisis that has all morphed into each other. And the big question is, how are we going to unwind from this system? Clearly, it is the financial system that needs to be at the forefront of helping this unwinding to happen. I'd like to say that we one of the big issues in the emerging markets today has been over indebtedness, both in the public and private sector. And these are problems that escalated and started way back in 2010. And we've seen financial systems over and over again get into the Sorry, sorry about that. Now, where do I see the bright spots? I'll say the bright spots really are going to be in almost 90%, it's going to be, I see it really in Asia, 90% of the next billion entrants into the global middle class is going to come from Asia. We're going to have to look at the financial inclusion agenda a lot more closely. The digital payment system has taken a huge shot in the arm. Today, for instance, in India, we have financial inclusion accounts, 98% of households have access to formal credit or bank accounts. And uh, we're looking at, you know, the mobile phone database has really helped to capitalize, catalyze financial systems. So if I were really to look at the future, I would say the future lies in countries where financial penetration is low and there are lots of solutions to be able to deepen that financial penetration across. Thank you. Andre, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, We've had a, an enormous success, though, also, right, in the last four or five years in financial inclusion. As I understand it, 300 million new bank accounts were set up. Right. And so there's an enormous lesson there for the rest of the world, too, in terms of how you do it. And also, you know, the digital infrastructure that has been set in place, you know, what they call the uni unified payment interface. That yes. I understand that, you know, a lot of other international countries are looking at the India model. And it's really ironic because on one hand, we've got the system well in place, but on the other hand, the health of our banking system is really quite perilous today. Yes. So we'll have to look at a series of different solutions to be able to solve these problems, but I really see the countries which need to, which have our domestic consumer-based countries really have a future ahead to be able to look at deepening these financial markets. 
Interesting. Um, Neha, um, bringing this to current events and especially the pandemic, um, what do you feel are the shortcomings um, of the investing world? And in particular, is it balancing the importance of maximizing returns alongside creating a more inclusive and sustainable world? I think uh, in the current situation, of course, the whole world is uh, sort of shaken up, right? And it's not just the financial services industry, but pretty much uh, all the industries uh, that we know of have been shaken up. So there is uh, a need for change for sure. I think the way um, um, th there is a place of different so finance and financial institutions play different roles, right? There are different financial institutions which play different roles. An institution like IFC, which I represent, uh, which, has, uh, which is a development financial institution, um, we try to balance the commercial as well as the developmental impact of capital that we provide. Our strategy is not just to maximize returns, but to create markets, mobilize private capital, and see how we can address the developmental gaps in countries which do not have uh, or, or do not have adequate capital flows. Um, so for example, the way we look at it is we will try to create a market, but it has to be done through a project level outcome. So not to say that returns are not important, but they have to be uh, uh, sort of profitable uh, projects have to be supported, which, have, which can solve development problems at a scale. Uh, and I think uh, the COVID, the current COVID situation, the COVID-19 situation has only exasperated the sort of uh, need for such capital. Uh, and of course, once things come down to normal, come down to more normalcy, whatever the new normal is in the new situation, you will have more commercial players who will come in and therefore uh, support the industry at, at the second seat or the next phase of uh, growth. Sure. Neha, from what you say, you believe there are many situations where um, capital that is, that is only seeking a return will not play a role because the market is not ready. So there is a very critical role for development finance to come in. But the development finance that is available is actually relatively small compared to the capital that is seeking a return as their highest priority. Um, how do you see that equation changing? So, uh, see, there's a reason for that, right? Because, for example, if you look at the private equity industry in India 20 years ago, the amount of development finance you needed to, to scale up that industry and make it viable and to get to attract new entrants so that this industry becomes attractive and sustainable was very small. And therefore, if you look at the recent entrants as LPs into these markets, into the market in India, they are a lot larger, they're a lot bigger, and they're cutting uh, much bigger checks. And that is, I think, by nature, the way the financial industry should, uh, in any case, uh, evolve. So you're right, there is a lot more capital needed, but I think the effectiveness of that capital is actually more important than the scale of, uh, of that capital or the volume of capital which is available. Sure. Because if, if you have a large amount of capital available, which is uh, development finance, but it is still not effective, you will never be able to make that industry viable for the new commercial players to come in and therefore play the role that they're supposed to play in the next stage. Sure. I, I can see a few of you on the panel are ready to comment on this too, but let, let, me, um, let me finish and continue because we have two members of the panel who have um, very important things to say about this too. Anyway, um, and the technology can do this, but technology has you on your side right now. You think you could turn your phone so that we can, we can see you kind of grounded? I did. I don't know what's going on here. I, Excellent. We've got am you. I on? We've got you now. Okay. Um, Dingwei, so coming back to that question. So your experience is so broad too, across banking and investing, um, you know, service provision in, in finance very broadly too. Um, and you're, you're one of the largest investors in China in the private field. Um, how do you see finance contributing in positive or negative ways to, to human and social development? I think that uh, uh, finance is perhaps the most essential thing to economic and societal development, along with technology. 
And the role of finance changes from period to period, from uh, locality to locality. Uh, in the case of modern China, I think uh, if you look at the uh, um, first 30 years after 1949, uh, it was a planned economy. It was an economy of short of capital, um, short of saving as well. And uh, 40 years ago, when China started to reform, and the, the task is to really to mobilize uh, uh, funds for economic development. And finance, in essence, is really to mobilize resource and allocate resource, to mobilize resource from those segments of society and population with surplus, with um, surplus that they don't, do not need, and uh, to allocate them to uh, whatever purpose of the priority at the time. So in the case of China, I think uh, the role of finance changes uh, um, quite a bit in um, uh, 1978, when Deng Xiaoping started reform, clearly what China needs is technology and, uh, and, and finance. So not only that, uh, that China needs to better utilize population saving, which, which China is always at a relatively high level uh, domestically, um, but most importantly, uh, they need foreign capital. And, and that policy, uh, that finance focus has successfully uh, modernized Chinese, Chinese economy. Today's situation is slightly different. Uh, China uh, continues to grow at a reasonable rate and the surplus of population uh, in terms of saving is, remains very high. So I think financing is going um, to really focusing on um, to the new areas of social development priority, whether it's environmental, whether it's uh, international development, on uh, addressing inequality uh, in China and globally. So, th th so I think that, uh, that uh, to me, there's no question about it, that the role of finance uh, changes, number one. Number two is, in large part, is a very, very good one, positively. To, um, if you believe, if you look at, the, if you con you're convinced that ever since World War II, that uh, the, the society, economy, and the country and the world at large has developed it, uh, uh, in a mostly, by and large, is, 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 is uh, worthy of this development and I think finance law is important. But today's problem, uh, many problems that uh, many panelists have mentioned, that you have mentioned, uh, uh, I think finance has failed to help address, to notify society. Today, I think we are at a stage whereby that most governments and, uh, and, uh, and the countries realize that uh, finance has a role beyond what I said, to mobilize resource, uh, finance the growth. Uh, you need to look at the society in general and uh, addressing this issue as well. And the technology is helping us in doing that. So in the past, you, you raised the question of the role of big finance. Partly in the past, there's no technology available and, um, and, 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 and you, you need to uh, set up these big organizations to uh, provide backbone to, to, to finance and, and, the, and the, the target, the finance is also the big companies, the industrial revolutions. So this situation is different. The technology is changing and we are turning each individual into consumer as well as producers. Our technology is enabling us to do that. And we perhaps we don't need that many big, uh, big, big institutions, which is, uh, on the one hand, they have done very good things, particularly financing, in financing, for example, infrastructure, huge industrial project. But on the other hand, they also curtailed initiative, uh, initiative as well as perhaps did not focus addressing the needs of the um, uh, smaller companies, smaller projects in the segments of the population. We are facing with uh, uh, a changing world. We are facing changing role of finance. And what we need to do is in each country, each of our institution, in whatever field, finance is a big area that has many types of finance. We all have to adapt to this new challenge as well as utilizing new technology. technology. No, that's a very interesting thing, Wei. You, you may be common with Adam as saying the large financial institutions, um, their role has changed and it's even questionable whether such a large financial institution is even needed uh, in today's much more distributed world. I'm, I'm going to come back to that topic in the second uh, part of our, our forum. Um, but, but let me come to Osamu. Um, Osamu, Japan has some of the biggest pools of savings and pensions in the world. 
It's, it's, it is one of the richest savers of capital. And then applying it, of course, and how it applies, it makes a huge difference to the world. And there has, there's been this quantitative and qualitative easing. And in that process, uh, the size of the Bank of Japan's balance sheet is bigger than any other financial institution pension fund uh, in Japan. I, I think um, six trillion US dollars or thereabouts. It's bigger than the GDP of Japan, I believe. Um, with the COVID shock to the economy, you know, other central banks are also, of course, in a position where they have a huge stock of capital too. Do you see a significant role, number one, for central banks in, in changing finance and addressing the world's issues? And as a supplementary question, how do you see Japan and its financial institutions changing the way finance works? Thank you, Kata. Uh, it's a big question about uh, our role of central bank and uh, you know, role of uh, uh, investable, investable capital from Japan. But before getting into that, uh, first, I think we are in a great transition and I'm very optimistic about that. Let me tell you this, okay? And we are in the transition and into a new world order. I would call that the sustainability-based capitalism. Yes. All right. And uh, everybody is uh, now talking about sustainability and it unites people regardless of, uh, you know, age, gender and sex and, uh, you know, wherever you are. That's a great thing. That's the first recognition. And in that sustainability based capitalism, you know, one important aspect to it is that there's no trade off between financial returns and the social impact. There, in ultimate form, that means both, us, both financial returns and social impact mean the same thing. Unfortunately, however, we are not yet that point. That is why poor central bankers fighting to find a very, very narrow path yes. to get us from here to there. That's my opinion. Yes. All right. So, uh, you know, in Japan's case, we public are pushing too much pressure, okay, on Bank of Japan. Low inflation rate, all right, and uh, this inflation, low growth, and a COVID-19 shock, looks like everybody is, you know, BOJ's problem. Yes. That's too much. But it's a public opinion, like I said, you know, there's a huge pressure on that. So that's their, you know, uh, the reason why they have to into the unprecedented QQE. Yes. But once again, this is a one big role that central bankers are now trying to take to find a narrow path to make that transition that I talked about. Yes. Now, um, yeah, let me finish. Carry on. carry on, please. Is that okay? Yes. Now, very quickly, the, the you know, investor capital side, it has a huge, huge, uh, you know, role to play, ESG. Yes. So uh, GPIF, you talked about 350 trillion investable capital. They have 1.4 trillion US dollar. And yes. they are big in ESG. That's a, that I think is a hope for the future. Like I said, in the ultimate form, financial returns and social impact at the ultimate form mean the same thing. Let me yeah. stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, look, I, I, we have touched on so many aspects of finance in this first question in terms of, is it really fit for purpose? And overwhelmingly what I hear is that um, large big finance, older big finance is not fit for purpose. Its purpose is changing. Um, but there are other, other missions within finance, sovereign wealth fund mission in the GIC, the development finance mission, the housing finance mission to, to promote inclusion that are fit for purpose and need to be scaled and made more effective, as you said, Neha too. Um, but, but I think we'd be, we would have not addressed the question still if we did not come to the equity markets in particular. And Adam, I'd like to draw you in here. The equity markets have recovered from their position at the beginning of the year while the global economy is devastated. What's going on? Why is that the case? And um, are the markets and the economy disconnected? Um, and is, if so, is this state of affairs set to continue to the second half? 
because there is a feeling amongst people who are not participants in the equity markets that perhaps it's just a great big casino yeah. where participants make money for themselves while the rest of the world suffers. What, what's going on, Adam? You're a sophisticated <laughs> participant from your time at Goldman, uh, all the way, and I've known you since I was at Goldman, all the way through. Sure. What's going on? I'm going to answer that in a moment, but I'm going to attempt to, to link it to uh, Osama's points, which I think are incredibly insightful, by the way. Uh, and that is central bank, central bank acting as this to guide us through this transition. The, the, the issue for central banks, by the way, in that transition, I think, uh, other, than the, the, than the, other than the obvious objective, remain the fact that they also are regulators and what they do on the regulatory side is gonna be very important in determining the outcomes that they want, society wants, et cetera. And furthermore, because they are now working through the asset price channel, through quantitative measures, through the asset channel, I think it's rather disingenuous, frankly, when, when, when Powell goes on 60 Minutes or testifies in front of Congress, et cetera, and denies that there is any real impact on inequality. There is an obvious impact on inequality because if you're going to work through the asset channel, there is a disproportionate benefit to the pre-existing owners of assets. Yep. And, and that, that part of that is the answer to your question, Katan, which is obviously there's been a major shock to the real economy, to the labor market uh, in particular. And uh, a pronounced impact on small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, many of the, the, the full extent of which we don't really know yet because we haven't gone through that solvency crisis or solvency uh, uh, episode, because for now, what, what the central banks have done is inject a massive amount of liquidity. Money supply is accelerating dramatically. Uh, that's part of the toolkit. And, and as you know, they are actually going in and physically buying, uh, intervening in markets, buying uh, assets selectively, particularly in the credit markets. And that has a knock-on effect uh, to, to, to broader financial markets. Um, at the same time, I would say that there, this, this notion of a disconnect is, I, I also think, somewhat misguided. Um, the, fa the financial markets don't need to necessarily reflect the state of the underlying economy. Uh, and they're going to reflect it less the more intervention there is through the asset price channel. Right. Furthermore, furthermore, what's happened is um, as the, this massive amount of liquidity is effectively what, what, what we've done is, or what the central banks have done is create a collision of a smaller universe of deemed acceptable assets, right? That which isn't going to be bought by these, these sovereign actors, or that which where there's questions about the future, maybe something like commercial, uh, uh, commercial real estate, the, those markets have not bounced back nearly as, as much as those where there is direct intervention or where there is the, the channel of liquidity. So as you know, uh, money market funds just in the United States in, you know, since the, the, the set of uh, uh, fiscal transfers, uh, money market uh, asset growth is up about a trillion and a half dollars. So you've papered over theoretical losses and in fact created savings or at least liquid savings for deployment and that's being invested uh, in the equity markets because that channel exists and there's not, there, there, are, there are many assets that have been disqualified and then other another universe of assets which don't yield or offer much in the way of either nominal or real return. And so I think it's fascinating that, that um, regardless of income cohort, if you look at the data, 
over the last, since, since the shock, since March, so April and May data, regardless of income cohort, whether you're 150,000 above, 75,000 to 150 or below 50, the new fund creation, new account creation rather, uh, in the US as a, as a frame of reference is up three times what the previous run rate was. And then actual trading in the equity market, regardless of cohort, is up between 85 and 90 percent, 85 and 95 percent uh, in, in each of those cohorts. So clearly, that's why the markets, the, 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 the S&P or the equity markets are exhibiting a, a different uh, return profile than what the underlying economy, uh, economy might suggest. Is there a coming true in the second half when actually the results of corporations come out and they're not very good? The, the, the answer to that, as you know, is it depends. Uh, if, you know, I think the, the, way, the way we've, we've modeled it, and, and I will uh, say that I'll, I'll refer uh, uh, people uh, attending this call to a piece written by uh, Lakshman Antetan of uh, ECRI. He published it a week ago. Uh, where he said actually, uh, and, and, and it, it's, it's a very well-established economic uh, forecasting uh, uh, group. He, he, he posited last week that this, there is no disconnect. This makes sense because as long as the trajectory is, is uh, following this profile, in other words, we've done 10 weeks in a row where the weekly leading indicators are improving, 10 successive yeah. weeks. So as long as the trajectory looks like improvement, then I, then I think the markets will continue to exhibit uh, a, a, a similar, char similar characteristics of what we've seen over the last two months. If you actually, if the markets actually begin to question whether that trajectory is, is going to continue. In other words, if the, the rebound starts to look more like a square root, then, yeah then there will be payback. Then you, 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 what you're, implicitly what you're asking is, will there be an adjustment in the second half? My, 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 uh, my belief is yes, but it's really more about the trajectory, not about the, the in, in my view, the, the absolute uh, uh, numbers at this stage of the, new, of the new cycle. Okay, Prakash, just to help us wrap Sorry. Sorry, Kevin. Hi, this is Neha. I just wanted to add one more thing. Please, Neha. One of the reasons, you know, if the even if the trajectory is up and things are up, it is quite possible that if valuations are very high, there will be capital which will start flowing into the private markets rather than the um, sort of uh, the, the public markets. And that could lead to the public markets coming to slightly saner valuations as well, because there will be a, a reallocation of capital from one market to the other. And that will also be, I think, critical uh, as a burden. Thank you, Neha. Um, that, that's an important thought. Prakash, I wanted you to come in on that. Neha Zan Adams comment there. You know, you're, you're the chief economist at the GIC. You see, you take a long-term view and you see how these events affect your long-term view uh, and how it might affect your model. What, what can you share with us about your perspective on this? Yeah, sure. So I, I think there's, um, I mean, for any, anyone who is kind of familiar with finance 101, uh, you know, asset prices at the end of the day are discounted sum of future stream of earnings. I think what the market is really taking into account is that going to the point that uh, Osamu and Adam raised as well is that the discount rate has fallen uh, uh, quite dramatically. Um, I think the challenge here is that a lot of people confuse the risk-free rate with the true discount rate. Um, and the true discount rate actually should include some form of equity risk premium. Uh, and I think this, this is where the market is having a very hard time uh, pricing in that equity risk premium because, um, you know, Ketan, you asked about the second half uh, uh, of, of the year and, and Adam rightly talked about the trajectory, but, there is a there is the a, a very f fundamental uncertainty that we're dealing with here, which is which is the trajectory of the virus. 
Um, yes. And, you know, I mean, uh, we have models from, from experts who, who have dedicated their whole lives to studying infectious diseases. And um, they'll be the first to admit that, that even they don't know uh, what, uh, uh, what's likely to, to happen. Uh, and so, uh, you know, our concern here is really about that lack of um, uh, incorporating some element of that equity risk premium and just really taking uh, the fact that money is so cheap uh, at this moment and, and, and discounting that uh, uh, into the future. And, you know, the virus is just, is just one of those things. You know, I mean, we, we talked about uh, uh, some of the tensions uh, with, uh, with uh, US-China. Uh, we also talked about, uh, you know, other various uh, uh, challenges that the world uh, is dealing with. Um, and so I think the problem here right now is that um, we are pricing in a scenario which um, could happen. Um, uh, but, you know, I think the, the asymmetry around that uh, is is very skewed uh, to to one side, um, and I think the the allure of uh, of uh, private equity, I think as Neha pointed this, um, is is true. Uh, I mean, you know, if if this does end up being a very V shaped recovery, uh, then the ability to kind of ride through that uh, uh, that storm, uh, there is value to to private equity. I think the challenge here is that. Um, this episode has made people realize actually the value of liquidity. Um, so at the, at the times when you, when you do need um, uh, liquidity, um, are you sure that, you, that, that you're able to raise it uh, at the right time? Uh, mm -hmm. I think you know, we've had a very long expansion cycle before this COVID crisis. A lot of people didn't value uh, 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 liquidity. Uh, and so I think that, that calculus uh, for some investors uh, is also happening at the margin, which is, given the uncertainties I'm facing, am I willing to lock up my capital uh, with some of these structures? Uh, and so I think that also uh, gets into the calculation when it thinks about uh, private equity. Thank you, Prakash. Um, Chris, um, an insight from you, please, Chris. Um, tell us, how, what would you lend to the discussion we've had so far before we transition to the next, uh, next part of the discussion? I think maybe coming back to some of the some of the earlier comments or or, or the original question, which is what what can finance do, uh, or what is finance's role in in affecting global change, and what are the things they can change? Um, you know, coming back to something Adam said way up front, you know, finance doesn't change anything. Finance is a is a necessary utility. You know, it's ultimately people that change things, and finance is a or, or capital is a very very important tool for doing so, alongside technology. I think which is what Ding Wei said. Um, so, you know, what, what's really important is the, the role of the individual, the role of the individual investor to, uh, to, to affect change and to use their capital as, 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 a force for, as a force for good and a force for change. And that clearly is not something that happens only at the level of the financial services industry, but at the level of the 70% of the wealth, which is owned by individuals as investors who can make choices around how their capital is deployed just like they can make choices around who to give their vote to, to affect policy, or they can make choices around, you know, how they, what, what companies they choose to support as, as consumers. And, you know, if we're talking about really affecting global change, it, you know, finance has an important role to play, but, you know, there are many other parts of society that all have a role to play and it requires people uh, working together in a coordinated fashion uh, towards a common goal. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That, that, that's uh, very insightful too, uh, and, a, and a perfect transition to the next section. Um, look, we could still carry on this topic because there are so many parts of this in terms of analyzing that we haven't dealt with. But I'm going to take topic two and some of topic three together, but particularly topic two is um, how do we finance, how do we actually finance the future? And that, that implies we have to finance the transition and also, also lay the ground for what will be the future. So the elements of that would be number one, you know, first we have to save the planet. We have to restore the ecosystem, clean the air, the land, seas, but without saving the planet, that there isn't really a role for much else. So one part is that. Two, there will be 10 billion people by 2050. Um, we, we would be you know, missing an action if we did not take into account that we, we need the resources to actually serve 10 billion people not that far away. Um, we, we, of course, therefore have to figure out how to rebuild our living spaces, the homes, the schools, the workplaces, the infrastructure. Um, 
we have to also build a new digital world. Um, our, our children, and some of us are of course participants in that in an active way, um, but that creates, augments and replaces some parts of the physical world. And so we're, we're going to preside over a transition that destroys some of what was built up and became very powerful in the industrial world through this new digital world. Um, we'll have to find a new energy source that is clean, abundant, cheap, radically more functional, um, just as carbon was over the previous ones. Somehow we have to migrate away from carbon to something that is radically better uh, and breaks the limits of, of where we are stuck today. And we have to replace the natural resources. And if we add, beginning of the century, we have 6 billion people, 6.1, I believe, we're projected to have 10 billion by 2050. We'll use up everything, of course, in the process, and we have to find synthetic or other means to replace that. And I'm, I'm sure the mortality rate will change quite dramatically with breakthroughs in, in medicine. People will live far, far longer. And, you know, there is talk of people living forever unless they get run over or, you know, die of some mortal wound. So, you know, we, we have a very different world growing up. And at the same time, we will either learn to live in peace, um, which is beyond our experience in some ways um, as a species, or have war without limits. And then everything above us actually may not matter so much. Uh, and this, of course, has to be underpinned in some way by new values based on knowledge and tolerance and fairness. Um, and of course, at the same time, we're investing already to move beyond this planet's limits. Um, finance has a big agenda. If this is the, the makings of an agenda for what is the next civilization that we have to prepare for, we are so tied to today's civilization. Um, how do we make that transition? Now, those are obviously very big questions. We're going to get a snapshot of discussion on that. And uh, we'll continue that, I'm sure, in many other discussions. I'm going to start by, by taking, um, by going to one example of making that transition, which, which um, and I'm going to turn straight to Anjali on this, um, India is in that transformation. India is a country that potentially missed the, the industrial revolution. And um, it didn't generate the employment and the formal employment, particularly nearly 90% of Indians still get paid in the hand. India has announced this National Infrastructure uh, Investment Fund, the IIF, which is designed to build a, build a new infrastructure. India will have to build a digital infrastructure at the same time and potentially is the first economy to end up as a digital power in the world going ahead rather than going through the industrial piece. Can you share examples of the transformational role that finance has played? And you know, your bank is part of that in terms of bringing in the inclusion uh, that, that is preparing people for the future. Yeah, thank you. You know, Ketan, let me just take a step back and just, you know, use an example of transformational role of finance. And let me just start very, very briefly to tell you, HDFC was the first mortgage finance company set up in 1977. At that time, there was absolutely no mortgage finance available in the country. And there was a vision of a founder who said that, yes, people needed that last mile funding to be able to buy a home. Yet at that time, you know, most people said that you won't be able to, nobody will pay you money back. There was no access to long-term funding and there were no foreclosure laws in the country. But fortunately, we had investors like IFC and the Aga Khan Foundation. They came in with $5 million. That was the investment. It came in with a social objective. 40 years later, we're looking at HDFC with assets of size of about 70 billion. Now, the reason why I take this example as a transformational role of finance is that we started out with a social objective. We moved out as the economy opened up in India. We started to diversify into banking, insurance, asset management, where a financial conglomerate today with 150 billion market cap as a group level. Most of our shareholders today, so we started with the social objective. Today, your shareholders are sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, global equity players. And what it really shows is that you start out with an investment, you have to grow, you have to see the viability of the investments, 
And value creation happens over a long period of time. So when you come back to the question, Ketan, of asking about infrastructure, there's a lot of scope for a country like India to be able to attract capital. But capital will come only if it sees it it's easy for capital to flow into the country. If investors have the confidence to see that they will get a decent return on capital. And today with countries that have almost negative interest rates or very, very low interest rates, India is a very attractive market. But at the same time, the ease of doing business still needs to be worked upon. India has many opportunities in terms of investment, but the main thing is finding the right partners because governance is a very, very important part of finance. And the second thing is we need patient capital because we've seen too much of short termism. We really need long term investors who are going to be able to see the broader picture. Thank you. So that's, um, that's a good way to put it. And I'm going to bring Neha straight in on that. Neha, you know, in a, in a country like India, of course, also, given its growth and its dynamism, um, we, we have a, a female population too, um, a gender population that has not really been sufficiently involved you know, in the economy. And it's such a critical part that's missing in the equation. How do you see that changing too? And then I'm gonna ask somebody else to speak on this too in a moment. So I think um, it is important to sort of uh, so women, for example, in India, almost up to 50% of the population is uh, women, right? So, and if you don't have women participation in the workforce or in the labor force, you're actually um, uh, letting go of a large part of productivity of this population, and that is getting wasted. Uh, so I think one of the issues that a country like India we, we see is uh, why are women not in the labor force? One, because of support, because of uh, nuclearization of families, etc. I think as an organization, we look at gender balance uh, as a very critical sort of part of investments. And, uh, you know, it's important to note that uh, gender balance is now proven to have sort of uh, links to financial returns as well, better, uh, better returns as well. So I've actually had uh, uh, sort of come out with a report uh, of, of uh, investments uh, sometime in 2019 where we explored the links between financial returns and gender balance and uh, it proved that gender balance schemes can generate 20% higher returns than uh, a team which is predominantly either, either men or women driven and if you look at companies which are uh, sort of more gender balanced in their senior management uh, it was it was again we found a clear linkage of uh, a 25 percent higher valuation of those companies versus their counterparts which are not gender balanced so it's it's important to understand that it is not just um, uh, it is not just hearsay or it is not just uh, there is there is actually proven research to say that yes it is better to have more gender balanced teams and therefore um, before I switch to uh, one of the others um, the social development goals are an agreement between the world, unprecedented in some ways, in terms of agreeing a mission, a series of measures, 17, and a quantitative way forward to, have to know how we're going to move forward. So the question for you, you are perhaps uniquely in this panel focused on the SDGs as a filtering criteria and as an objective that has to be achieved alongside the other returns. It's an explicit criteria. Can you speak a little bit to that, please? Because that may be one of the solutions we need as we go forward, of course. So let me start by saying that ESG no longer is just a risk mitigation strategy. I think till very recently when investment firms or financial services firms look at uh, ESG, they think that uh, this is more a uh, uh, loss sort of uh, minimization strategy. That if, you, if you're okay on the environment side, you're okay on the governance side, you're not going to face losses. I think what is now changing is uh, ESG is now a profit maximization tool as well. Uh, better governed companies, better environmentally conscious, better socially conscious companies can actually generate better returns and therefore you're optimizing your returns not just minimizing your losses when you're looking at ESG. Sure. Um, now, moving on to sustainable development goals, uh, there are 17, so, so, uh, the, the blueprint of SDGs is about 17 uh, SDGs. 
IFC is, is driven by two SD, SDGs, uh, which is number one and number 10, that is low poverty and reduce inequality. That is the underlying theme for all investments that is done by IFC and IFC's overall strategy is driven by these two SDGs. Having said that, all the other sustainable development goals like climate, gender, all of them form a very critical part of, uh, of organizations like uh, IFC. And I think it is again important that organizations weave these SDGs and these goals into their strategy, again linking it back to maximizing financial returns responsibly. Thank you. And Norman, I'd like to bring you in here. What is the solution to this? Your, your young clients, the next generation, how do they see ESG? Uh, of the households, of course, you know, a large proportion of those households are the wealthy households, and the next generation is ready to take over the helm. If they see ESG as important, that makes a difference to the application of capital. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Norman? Sorry. Um, as I said earlier, I think it's the most important topic on their minds. Um, and one they are um, very, very deeply look into um, the, the generation that is already in charge. So the second generation, if you will, that's, that's already in charge. And the people that are too young to, uh, to be responsible for investing in, this, um, in, in the markets or uh, distributing the, uh, the wells. But it's without any doubt uh, the most important issue that they have. As I said before, they are really concerned about the existence or the, the continuation of our democracy and of the environment. And uh, so that is a very powerful message they are giving. And I think um, it's important for any financial institution or for, for us in the financial markets to listen to their clients again. And, and I can only s say that about the situation in Germany or in Europe, and I think we've lost that uh, to a certain extent. And, um, and I think that is important to, for all of us um, and for any party involved in this whole um, financial conglomerate um, that we have globally. I think that is we have to work together. We have to listen to each other. We have to be prepared to um, take long-term views and, um, and that will hopefully uh, enable us to, to be less divided and, and less opinionated. Um, we, have to, we have to make a change as soon as possible to live as long as possible. Or just no, I wonder whether uh, I, I could later impose a, something on you, which is you, you gather 50 or 100 of the, the young that you're talking about and get them to participate with the UN WAS program on how they will insist that ESG is a part of investments going forward. Because that may be a solution. If we had you know, a, a very informed, passionate, caring young group that, that controlled some of the strings of finance as the next generation or willing to do something about it, that might, that might make a difference. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to to see um, and to witness the, um, the developments um, in, in the families, because in, in the olden days, and that's not too long ago, uh, you had a family office and they would invest in all sorts of investment vehicles. And then you had the family and they would do, they had their own philanthropy, they had their own um, hobby to do, to give something back to society. Now this has changed now um, it's part of the family office to look after these investment, after philanthropic issues. Um, and, and I think that has a big, big impact and meaning that they also accept, the families also accept that the returns might be lower, but the, the, the impact they have is much higher. And, and that has a tremendous change in this, in this country. And again, uh, I think the financial industry has to adopt that, has to understand it, accept it, and help to, to bring it to, into fruition. Okay. 
Um, Ding Wei, let me bring you in here. China has seen the, the most enormous transformation from poor to becoming a rich country. What are the lessons you think for the world that we can take from China to help transition the two thirds of the world that are not participants? What are the specific ideas, solutions you think that the rest of the world could learn? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm happy for you to draw on you know, your wide experience, not just your experience as an investor. I think uh, uh, the first lesson I would think uh, I can give to other countries, uh, China can give to other countries, is a, not less than uh, a prescription uh, that's universal. Uh, China has developed its way of development, model of development, uh, on the basis of its trial and error over many years. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, looking at the whole picture, compare China's model of development with others, you have a few distinctive features. Uh, one is, of course, the heavy state government hands. Uh, second is much larger organizations from central to local. And the thirdly, state ownership is uh, also uh, quite large uh, proportion um, for many of the industry and financial institutions. These are um, very uh, basic features of, of China's financial finance. Okay? and whether it can be uh, uh, exported or learned, uh, utilized or copied by others, I actually highly thought about it. I would not advocate it, uh, but you can, sum you can uh, summarize, you can, uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can present to others for others to consider. And I think that uh, East Asia in general had this model whether it's Singapore or Japan in the early days or Korea. Uh, and today also in the case of, 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 of Vietnam in a way. Uh, more or less that uh, um, from top down uh, central planning, but not really uh, as planned as in the early days, okay, but certainly still with state guidance on industrial policy, on export policy, on tax, et cetera. It worked for certain stages. But today, for example, uh, today's China is no longer, uh, no longer uh, 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 suitable for this same model. Uh, we see increasing problems, uh, stress from financial institutions, and I think most people are worried about whether there will be a financial crisis in China. Uh, the reason is, um, uh, on a simplistic way, highly simplified way, is that the old model of finance, all the structure of finance direct most of resources, almost all resources to the, um, uh, to the, uh, the key sectors that the government wants to promote. And, um, and, and the financial sector, mostly owned by the uh, state ownership, whether it's local or, or, or central, uh, feels comfortable to lend to state of, at, at different levels, whether it's for infrastructure or for industry. Even, even though that it may not be a very good project, but they know they are going to, the loan itself will not be defaulted. So what happened is that you see that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, this system is self-fulfilling. They direct more and more resources towards the state sectors. And yeah. yet, the today's economy needs much more diversified growth coming from, from small business, from new technology, from private sector mostly, because are highly risky, whether it's a drug development, uh, it's new technology development, and uh, only private sector is willing to take the risk. And uh, what, in the past, we have relied heavily on foreign capital. As a foreign capital, uh, uh, particularly in telecom sector, information technology sector, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that there's no restriction in terms of uh, TMT sector. So, uh, in fact, uh, Foreigners uh, uh, you know, through this structure, SPV structure or NIE structure, uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, allowed this private foreign money to come into this sector, and that's that's why we have ended up in huge uh, a company like uh, Alibaba, Tencent. They are owned, mostly it's actually foreign owned. You know, it's a Chinese company, but but it's foreign capital. Owned. 
Okay, but these are a few examples, but not like today's development will come from many smaller companies, many many different technologies at AI application of AI, big data, uh, it's actually 5G. You need a lot more participants. You need a lot more risk taker. Um, and, and, and I think our finance system is not able to provide that. So in that sense right. that uh, uh, there is a huge change as well. And how do you reform financial sector, banking sector? Uh, how do you integrate the technology? How do you change the ownership of, uh, of, of, of the financial sector? The regulation on that sector is particularly heavy handed and that is the case for many countries. But this all needs to be changed to Ingwe, adapt to a new world. Ingwe, you're revolutionary. You're effectively saying what makes I'm sorry. success needs to be abandoned. I can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? No? Uh, Adam, can you hear, hear me? Adam, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Yes, I can hear you. You can. All yes. right, Dingwe, I'm going to switch to Adam. Okay. Um, Adam, Dingwei effectively has laid out a revolutionary agenda where what made China successful is no longer relevant to the future. He's saying the big statist <laughs> that finance the state-owned enterprises, infrastructure, perhaps even the one, one road that is still being rolled out, that is not the future. The future is smaller dynamic enterprises. Yeah. You and I have spoken and the group did on, on one occasion about more specialist forms of finance, replacing big finance. Can you, can you comment a little bit about that? Because I think, Adam, you, you invest far beyond the macro fund in terms of your ideas and views. And I think it'd be interesting. We're looking for what Gary calls politic solutions, you know, that change the system. Uh, another colleague of ours, Frank Dixon, speaks about um, system change, the whole system change. Uh, another one of our colleagues, Lawrence Ford, speaks about conscious capital. Um, Please, I'd like you to reflect on what are the big solutions? I, uh, thanks, Mr. Tom. I think that Dingwei's point is that that model uh, is, 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 in the, is, is also sort of what Osama referred to. It's, it's in the process of being, it's in transition, it's in the process of being superseded by something uh, more specialized, certainly more dynamic. Uh, further distributed and, and, and as a result, uh, further democratized. Now, as you know, a lot of this is going on already organically, but it, it, it's not occurring uh, at scale yet. These are, these are small little pockets of, of entrepreneurial projects um, that exist in, 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 you know, often in parallel to the established formal financial system. Now, I happen to be a believer that they, the, these, these tracks will merge in time. And if there's any lesson uh, you know, over the last generation or the last 20 years or so, it, it tends to happen faster than we think. Hmm. Having said that, I do think to, 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 to go back to a, a comment I made earlier, I think if you, if you want to focus, if you, if you focus on the outcome, that you want to achieve, then from a policymaking standpoint, I, I think you need to regulate and incentivize accordingly. So, you know, one of the topics we haven't touched on yet is the, 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 the whole universe of sort of blockchain finance, the, the, what the, 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 the markets in crypto, for example, that facilitate- Please do, that. please do, Adam. It, it's, it's my view that, um, you know, I was an early participant uh, in, in, in those markets and still, you know, seven, eight years ago and still in, in, in involved today. Um, and it was my, if you, if you go back to the sort of origin of the, the birth of, of that, that marketplace, you'll recall that there was uh, a backdrop of a sort of libertarian ideology that these, these were currencies divorced from any centralized actor, et cetera. And, and there was some sort of philosophical nirvana attached to that. And I think what's, what's, what's happened in the last eight years is people have come to realize that if you want those markets to flourish, actually the libertarian notion is, 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 has been completely invalidated. In fact, what you want is regulation so that there becomes mass adoption. And it's not 
something that is a project, a theory that, 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 that might be uh, absorbed or imported into the formal financial sector, but in fact uh, competes with it and, and is part of the adaptive uh, process. Um, so, you know, I think about a world, and, 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 and this is just a very, you know, cute example, so to speak. I think about a world and it's not that far away. Three years, four years, you know, under the right circumstances where you're going to see a collision of the, the physical world and the so-called metaverse or what's going on in, in, in sort of gaming platforms, which themselves are their own form of social networks. Yeah. And you could have exchanges that where you can go from Singapore dollars to Bitcoin to V bucks to yen and then and then to Libras, which are still to be yeah. still to be created. That that's not that's not uh, a, a, an outlandish idea. And and the point is that the point of that is is that a lot of things are happening in these parallel systems that either can be encouraged or once you get to a certain level of development or scale, they actually can be imported back into what we think of as the, as the current or formal financial system. Yes. Now, uh, Adam, I, I want to bring in Osamu here. Osamu, what are the solutions from your perspective? See, what you've heard now is that the old model is bound to change or mm -hmm. die. Um, the new models are focused on social development goals, ESG standards, you've commented on that. Anjali's commented on the development and the growth and the participation and inclusion and how you know, her financial institution went through that evolution to get there. Ding Wei's spoken about the end of kind of the more statist model being an effective model. It's a, it's a cyclical thing. At some point it is valuable. And at some point, you know, people need something else. How do you see it, Osama? What are the solutions? Thank you, Kaitan. Uh, listening to, uh, you know, all their, my co-panelists uh, debate about solution, I think the solution in Conway in three forms. One is diversity, second is mobility, and yeah. third one is interdisciplinary approach. Let me yeah. elaborate very quickly one by one. Diversity we already covered, right? In the public pension fund, public pension fund, uh, you know, in every system, that you have public pension system. And in that, before world, there was not enough diversity. But now we have uh, more, you know, uh, gender diversity, generation diversity, race diversity. That is something that we need. Because why? Because, you know, public pension is a social common capital. Yeah. Any decision making should be based on broader, diversified views. That's one, one, one thing, right? That's diversity. Second is mobility. You know, you know people like Adam, if, if he works for a uh, central bank, that would revolutionize their way of thinking about asset pricing and uh, their way of uh, intervening uh, the market. By the way, their sort of purpose is, in my definition, to find a narrow path to make that transition that I referred to. Yes. So a mobility of talent is really the key and that should be even more facilitated in the social, social common capital like a public pension fund and central banks. And third one is interdisciplinary approach. You know, earlier we discussed how the current stock market, you know, the asset pricing is made, right? The, you know, the mainstream economics and the modern finance theory are the two pillars in the public pension and also in the, in the central banks. But you know, that kind of a, you know, asset pricing model, for example, is based on very, very equilibrium centric view. But in my view, we are far away from equilibrium because we are in the transition. Yes. Our, trans, our new equilibrium somewhere around there, and we are here. Yes. And between the past, there's no such thing like an inter, you know, uh, you know, intermediate equilibrium. 
it's just a disequilibrium. So we should learn a lot from the, uh, you know, disciplines like physics, engineering and biology, where many concepts and tools are developed and used to analyze phenomena far from equilibrium. So those are the three, I think, uh, key factors that should bring us the solution that you are looking for, Keta. Very interesting, very interesting. Prakash, I want to draw you in. I'm going to ask the same of Neha and Anjali in a moment too. What is the solution? How do we change the role of finance in the financial system itself and capitalism effectively so that it, it is more inclusive and more ready for financing the world? How do you see that happening? And we're transitioning into the third question with this too, as to how we make things happen. What do you see as solutions? And what do you see as the how, Prakash? Yeah, thanks, Katan. Um, I think, uh, going back to one of my earlier points, I think the, the, the solution really is, I think we need to find a way uh, to harness uh, the best that finance has to offer. Um, and then while mitigating its, its less desirable part. And I think different people in the panel have, have um, addressed different parts of this, uh, of this issue. Because ultimately, um, that role of finance in terms of you know, making that bridge between the source of capital and the use of capital, uh, that continues to be essential in, in solving a, a whole range of problems. Um, what, what, where I think the, uh, the best way to channel that resources is really to focus on the long term. Um, it's, it's one of those, uh, uh, you know, motherhood statements to a certain extent, but, uh, you know, at, at GIC, we, we, we really believe it. And, and, and in a way we, we do it by, by walking the talk. Um, you know, this, uh, involves, uh, a lot of the, the, the statements that we've heard around our panelists, you know, it involves, uh, being patient. Uh, it involves being, uh, uh collaborative with our investee companies. Um, really to ensure that that opportunity for value creation uh, uh, gets realized. Uh, mm. And it kind of, it internally, it shapes the way that, that, we, uh, that we view the world. Um, so, you know, some of the parts that Osamu talked about, which is, you know, that, uh, you know, we can't just focus on market sentiment. We have to think about fundamental trends. It's not so much about where we are today, but where that equilibrium is gonna be uh, yeah. uh, in the future. Uh, it is about strengthening uh, partnerships. Uh, it is about uh, uh, playing a stabilizing role uh, in, in terms of crises. So I think, I think the, look, finance is, is uh, made up of very smart people um, and they're always going to be innovating. Um, and I think it's just to make sure that uh, that innovation is really trying to solve the right problems. Uh, and I think, you know, as much as we can tilt that orientation towards being long-term, uh, and in this case, I think a lot of the issues of uh, sustainability that uh, uh, people around the panel have raised, uh, these are completely in line with, um, uh, with the notion of being long-term. So I think that's where the uh, uh, push needs to be. Thank you, Prakash. Um, Anjali, what is, what is the answer? Well, you know, Norman left you have us... You to a woman if you want the answer, obviously, right? That's why I've turned to you and then Neha, because we, we, you know, we've heard the men. So what's the answer? Well, let me start, you know, Norman left us with a lovely thought. He said, we've got to learn to listen to each other. That's, that really was a very key takeaway from me. But besides that, let me just say that, you know, right now there's a lot of political rhetoric on self-reliance. We've got to be very clear that we can't have barriers being erected as far as capital flows are, come, are concerned. Capital needs to go where it will be utilized the best. Some of the things of the changes are really, you know, we're looking at, looking at markets. Markets just work on trust and confidence. We don't need any further change on that. We need to have a huge amount of emphasis on governance. I think a lot of companies and a lot of uh, uh, issues have gone wrong with financial institutions. We need to guard against greed. You need to leave something on the table for investors. At this point in time, I think making companies more indebted is not the right way. We need more equity. Companies need larger equity at this point in time. Governance, values, ethics, transparency. We're also going back to basics as well. We're talking about the changes. We understand in terms of 
um, you know, the SDGs are going to be the focus areas. It's not going to come out of compliance. It's going to be companies that actually walk the talk that make the difference. Thank you. Neha, what, what is the answer? Should we, should we be mandated to put more money into development finance? I mean, for example, we work with the DFC in the US. They're taking a very strategic view on certain developing markets, particularly in India, and they're seeing it as a strategic long-term ally. What do, you, what, how do you, what do you see as the solutions that need to be put forward that we will all think about and change finance? So, see, change is constant, right? The markets are evolving, the situations are evolving, the responses are evolving, and players are evolving. Yeah. There is a continuous evolution which is happening as we speak. Um, it's, it's, it's wrong to say that, that change has not happened or uh, it's not enough. It will keep happening whether or not we like it. And yeah. therefore, I would say that different pools of capital and different financial institutions have different roles to play. Uh, it, will be, it, it will be wrong to say that we should focus on one or the other. It all depends on the situation and the circumstances or where, uh, you know, where are we trying to sort of, uh, what, what problem are we trying to address? What problem are we trying to solve? And each of these problems and each of the situation will warrant a different solution. Yes. Right. So can we say that, should we put in more money for development finance? Yes, but in a market which is not developed. If a market is already developed and you put in more money through development finance, I think it is only going to crowd out uh, the, the price, yeah. not what you want to achieve. And therefore, so I would say every situation, every player, every sort of uh, circumstance will be different. Different solutions need to be customized for different uh, sort of, uh, of these uh, yeah. situations. Um, can, I, yeah. can I jump in? Please. Can I Please. Jump <laughs> Go ahead, Dingwei. Okay, uh, I think all, uh, good, all the, what's said is pretty good with the, including ESG investments, uh, women participation, paying more attention to social agenda, et cetera. I think that this is uh, uh, the core of today. Um, but I think in the end, what is going to change uh, finance is perhaps um, uh, technology. The FinTech in particular, digital uh, currency, um, etc. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the main problem we have today is I think uh, uh, in finance, finance really worked for capitalism, okay, and the people get exorbitant return. And uh, some 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 segment of finance people, not all segment of finance people, get exorbitant because they are making use of imperfection in the system and relying on capitalism and to do that. And that is something uh, come to the detriment of. Uh, society at large because whatever you take more you leave less for the rest of agenda rest of population so what do we do it i think we need to reduce the cost of capital and increasing availability reaching more people and um, reaching more countries and uh, but to organize finance in a way that uh, in traditional way would be very difficult to do that it's it's it's, it's a big institution dominate it's uh, it, it, it is smart people dominated and it's a uh, uh, back door transaction dominated and um, uh, uh, regulation is such that uh, perhaps is controlled or influenced by a vast interest group to break this in the end is democratization of finance through technology. I think technology is where I put most hope uh, to answer Katan's question. You keep on driving at this, how do we get some solution from one paradigm of finance to future paradigm of finance. And I think all said by others, I agree entirely. These are things that we need to be aware and need to do. But I really pin hope on technology. And uh, by reducing the cost, making available of financing tools, the products through new technology, you are going to reach two thirds of people that's missing from today's financing. You're reducing the cost of, uh, of, of financing, reduce the cost of capital, therefore, therefore benefit everyone and increasing more resources for the social agendas we need to focus on. I, uh, uh, that's my uh, jumping point. Thank you, that's a powerful can I, thought. Can I add something, Quick. Katan, very briefly? Please, very briefly. Of course. <laughs> I think if we, if we look at the markets and we listen to the markets, um, and yes, there might be a disconnect to the real economy, but if we look at it, 
the driving forces behind the market were the big technology companies. They are the big beneficiaries. And I think that is exactly what we just heard. You know, we have the technology now, we have the finance now, that smart money is definitely going into this direction, and we have the macro environment to do this. So I think the internet of money is upon us. And it is it will drive down the costs exactly as the real internet did and it will enable more people to participate and it will enable more people to get the benefits out of a widespread um, financial system very good too i'm going to i'm going to open it up but first i'm going to ask chris chris an insight please and if there is a a, a question we tackled so many questions if there's a unique question still missing that you've seen in the Q&A panel. Um, please ask that too, I know we've been feeding them through. Chris. Sure, thanks. I mean, maybe, also, and also this is bridging to, to some of the questions. Um, there have been a lot of great points around what, what the solution for the financial service for finance, and you know, clearly, um, you know, whatever it is ends up being, or whatever the transition is that it makes, it is going to need to be fit for purpose for solving some of the big challenges that we've talked about, like sustainability, financial inclusion. And I think what is clear is that that requires more than money. Um, that is gonna require you know, sustained and coordinated uh, action, joint action on a, for, for long periods of time across many multiple actors to, uh, to solve some of these problems, like, um, like the space race almost. Um, you know, it took a decade um, of, I think, half a million people working together, solving thousands of problems to, to put a man on the moon and, and solving these challenges will probably require, you know, something similar. So, you know, among the transition, and, and Norman touched upon this earlier when he talked about the importance of working together. So amongst the transition that Osama was talking about, I think there also needs to be a transition in the industry for the flexibility of being able to work together where needed. Uh, and that's not, you know, coordination is not something that we typically like um, in financial markets because it distorts them. So, you know, that, that's something that the industry is going to need to need to figure out. Um, and, and there have been a couple of questions uh, around this. I think somebody asked and made the point that global challenges require global action. Um, but the reality is, is that the, the quality of financial capacity and financial infrastructure around the world is, is very different. You know, does that does that matter? And and what are the things that can be done to to address that? So let me put that openly to the panel, and anyone feel free to, to talk on this. How will the change happen? Is it going to be self-willed? Um, is it going to be imposed? Um, you know, is it going to be just a natural transition because technology just keeps flooding in, and we're a very innovative species, and we'll find the answer. You know, what's going to happen? Raise your hand if you have. Um, Great ideas on this, Adam. I, well, I suspect it's actually some of both. And so technology is flooding in, to Dingway's point, to, to, to Norman's point, the, the internet, of, internet of money, um, right? As the, as the traditional financial institutions have, have a questionable mission, the fintech providers or the large sort of mega tech companies all see the, the uh, opportunity within fintech, and they frankly have a, a better value proposition vis-a-vis -vis their customers, uh, and they will take market share. Uh, and, and, and so it'll happen in that form somewhat organically, but it might be accelerated at times through thoughtful regulation. The problem in, 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 in many respects is that most of the, of the policymakers uh, uh, related to these issues have been in some form of financial or, or addressing some form of financial crisis since the GFC. And then, you know, Europe, something after that, and now the one that we're, 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 in, the, we're in the midst of. So they haven't been terribly forward looking at all with respect to regulation, but that, that, that is likely to play a role as well. Yes. Uh, and any, anyone else with a thought on that, on the execution or some? Then Dingwei, first or some? Yeah, very quickly, the, uh, you know, my point is that you have to make a conscious effort. The, the beauty of finance and the financial industry is it's in, by nature, it's global. Look at the you know, diversity of the panel today and I look at the topic that we're talking about, it's by nature, it's global. But now in the short term, we are talking about, uh, you know, 
uh, the blocking economy and US-China issue, all those kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. So I would argue that we as a financial professional, a practitioner, as well as uh, you know, regulators, as well as uh, you know, social common, uh, people who are working for the social common capital, they have to consciously make an effort to make uh, opportunity like this constantly happen so that we can be part of the you know, global system. Mm -hmm. And then the world, I hope, the world will catch up with us. Sure. That's my Thank point. you, Osama. Ding Wei, we, we have um, a few minutes only. So in the next two minutes, I'm going to stop everybody and do a quick wrap up because uh, we're I'm washing the clock and we're in the countdown. Ding Wei. I just have an answer to your question that I think it's going to happen naturally. It will happen in post. It will happen by technology breakthrough. So it's going to happen out of all these reasons. And the second aspect is that it will come in both. Perhaps it will not be smooth. So we are going to have more volatility in financial market and in regulation in financial systems. And be prepared because all the con congruence um, are, are, are convergence of all these factors. So it's going to happen. Thank you. Um, Chris, anything further from the questions? You should have been a panelist, Chris, I'm afraid. We made a mistake there. Tell us, anything we're missing? There was no time. Um, yeah, here's, here's an interesting one, which, which was in the app specifically with regards to the financing of SDGs, but I think applies to any, any large uh, great thing that we need to change in the world, uh, which is really around the, the, the mismatch between private sector capital and some of these, these goods, given the fact that private sector capital you, you know, can't effectively price in the positive externalities that they have and the, the financial returns standalone are too, too low. Uh, you know, is that something that is, that is solvable? And, and if so, you know, what, what are some of the ways that that could be addressed to you know, create a, a match between the need for capital and the supply? Anyone with a 30 second thought only, I'm afraid, given how far we've gone? Yeah, or someone. Or someone. Yeah. Once again, uh, the solution lies in the, you know, uh, uh, public pension system that because of the perpetual nature like you said chris uh the placing the positive externalities externality is something that the natural capitalism cannot uh, cannot uh, handle but uh, with that perpetual nature of the you know public pension fund you can take that kind of view very very long-term view so that's that's my uh you know answer to that uh you know uh, the dilemma that uh, you just uh, laid out. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me draw it to a close with uh, a few remarks and trying to pull the so many strings together of, of this conversation. Uh, a difficult thing to do, I think, now. The, the first is this group, actually, if we read between the lines of everything so politely said, um, are, are saying there will be a revolution in finance where the existing system will break down and fail to perform. And naturally, and through self-will and through new players be restructured. And that restructuring will be wholesale and systemic, facilitated by technology, but a natural evolutionary process where large finance and status finance is, is less relevant to the future. At the same time, there's, there's a force for financial inclusion, which we see in development areas all around the world. And these development pockets exist in the US because 30% of their people are also not participants, not just in developing countries. And so development finance is required in, develop, in the developed world, as well as the rising new developing high growth world. And so specialist finance of various types, the team have also said, will be required. New currencies will be formed, and those new currencies will not just be small innovative entrepreneurs, but they'll be regulated and become the way we move forward replacing some of the physical currencies and exchanges in terms of how they work. Um, the new equilibrium will be sought out, but we're in disequilibrium because we're in transition. And there is very sophisticated long-term finance already in the world. Um, we've had examples from the GIC and others too, that will continue to play a very active role to stabilize, to invest in new things, and to be a strong base. And then the young will play an enormous part too, and we need to draw them in because they have a much more positive view about the SDGs, the development of the world. 
I, I would not be surprised if we needed an SDG 18, which for sustainable finance, so that it could sit alongside the 17 and be, be something that is thought through and implemented and embraced by the world. But we see cryptocurrency, technology, and transformation. And then the important point that the consumer is empowered by technology today. And individuals as citizens are empowered and they, they have their voice and they raise it. And they know where they want to go with this. And so either the system will adapt or the citizen will express their, their voice either at the, the ballot box or in the streets and things will change. And the power, 70% of the finance is in their hands, they will probably choose when they go into every shop to make a purchase. Is this a company that I wish to buy from? Just as we barcode today and we look in the back and we see how much carbohydrate or cholesterol or saturated fat is in, in this item, they will see whether this is a good business, a sustainable one, one that promotes their values. And so a value-based, a values-based financial system is bound to happen. Um, the question is how many participants will change to see it and move in that direction. But, but I, I thank the, the panel, I thank the audience for, for listening to and for their questions that have been sent through. Um, it's been a, a very interesting conversation. I'm sure we could continue it and we'll find another forum to do it. And thank you everybody for, for taking the time out. Thank you. Thank you for having it. It was a pleasure. Thank you all. Terrific. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Any, any wrapping remarks for us, Gary? I, I know you very carefully. Very carefully and my mind is wrapped. So <laughs> I wouldn't dare remark. I just like to absorb what I've heard from you all. It's really wonderful. Exceeded all expectations. Thank you all for it. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Stay Thank safe. You. Best wishes to your families. Thank you. Thank you.